My name is Tawana Brown, born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. I go by Tia, proud mother of two ad daughters, Antoinette and Tajima. They are in my life. I run an organization here, Beauty After the Bar. My name is Cedric Dean, founder and president of Safeguard Atone, Validate, Educate, Save, and I'm a Charlotte native. Morning, Ray. Well, I was incarcerated in the early 90s. I was actually, ironically, a student here at John C. Smith University, a college student, a cheerleader, pop, powerful, popular, just hanging out with the wrong crowd. And I was living a double life. And so being a young mother at that time and dealing with people that were in the street and dealing with drug dealers and dealing with people that were just doing everything they possibly could, the person that was in my life was abusive to me and very controlling which is the father of both of my daughters, and I had to find a way to keep up that lifestyle. So I was trying to do everything I possibly could, and I got involved in a fraud scheme, dealing with credit card checks, anything you name, IDs. I was a different person every day of the week. I didn't even know who I was myself sometimes. And so I landed myself, my situation very differently and not as violent as the situation most people would be in when you're dealing with drugs and guns and things of that nature. I don't point fingers at anybody because I could have very well ended up in federal prison for drugs and narcotics because I was around it every day. But I just say I was saved by the grace of God. My foundation was born, I was born and rooted in the church. So that I had a praying grandmother, praying mother, praying aunts. Come from a long line of strong African American women that was rooted in everything that I did. So I was living a double life. They didn't know the life I was living. I was living a lie. I would tell them one thing and I was coming to school doing something totally different and it just caught up with me. At the age of 16, I was sentenced to 14 years in state prison. And I did five years, six months, and four days. And the most difficult part of that time was I was placed in solitary confinement. And when I was placed in solitary confinement at the age of 16, I was carried around, I was fed food through a trap. I was carried around the chains everywhere I went. So I developed an animalistic type mentality to where I was addressing each other, what's up dog? Well, it was during this period that I was taught to be a thug, that I was taught to terrorize the streets when I got out of prison. So when I got out, Gary McFadden was there again and he tried to talk to me, but I didn't want to listen again. And one of the tie-ins that I would make is that it, he committed to me that solitary confinement for juvenile offenders is going to be one of the first things that he do away with. I spent four years in federal prison the first time. Notice I said the first time because I came home and during that era in the 90s, the early 90s, I'd be 47 on my birthday, which is June 12th. In the early 90s, you had a halfway house where you had to pay for the halfway house. And because I didn't have the funds or couldn't get a job because I was a convicted felon, I was sent back to prison to finish my, fin to, to finish my prison term. And so I experienced incarceration two times on one sentence. Because I didn't listen, 11 months later, I found myself in a federal courtroom and I was sentenced to life plus five years. The judge told me if I die and come back to life, I still had five years to do. So coming home from prison definitely was a challenge. Coming home from prison was a challenge for uh, many reasons. Rejection, uh, there's many doors closing your face and you know, Cedric and I both know that it's not hard trying to rebuild yourself back into the community. No one wants to be a part of your rebuilding. Everybody wants to put you away when you're charged with the crimes that you've committed and I don't really think they think convicted felons can change. I don't really think that I think they want us to be locked up in those cages forever. So when you run into somebody like Gary, who's a community activist, who's a homicide detective for the city of Charlotte, 27 to 30 years, someone that's prominent with the DA, the courts, he knows the law, the ins and outs. But one thing about Gary, even though he worked for the law, he could understand and identify for what was going on in the black community. So when I met Gary, after my incarceration, I told him what I was trying to do with my organization for young women and our youth, just keeping them out of jail, solitary confinement, I look at the stories and I follow heavy media on the internet where our black children, even white children, are being incarcerated at an alarming rate. The United States of America is the number one country for incarceration. We incarcerate more people than any country in the world. I told Gary I was starting this organization for advocacy for our youth 
to keep him out of jail, offering mentorship, going out to CMS schools, going out to YMCA, doing anything I can possibly do in the community to give our children the opportunity to be educated instead of incarcerated. Sharing my experience and being transparent about my experience, what I experienced in prison. I had a baby in prison. So you know if they send me to prison as a college student, honor student at John C. Smith on the chilling team, there could have been an alternative to incarceration, but that's not what they wanted. I begged and pleaded for my life in that courtroom. Had my school records, had people from John C. Smith there speaking up for me, telling them what kind of student I was, how I was involved in the community. They did not care. The judge told me, we got a place for you. We deliver your baby and you're going to federal prison. And that's exactly what happened to me. So when I came home and Gary said, I'll help you with your organization. I'll introduce you to some people that can sit on your board. I'll introduce you to some people that can pour into your organization so that you can save our youth. I knew then that it was going to be Gary and myself until the end of time. The reality is Gary McFadden helped me get my life back. Uh, he wrote my sentencing journal about and they told me he was crazy because he put his actual address in the letter, his home address. And he said, I meant to do that because I trust him. And I wanted you to know that I believe that he's going to come out here and he's going to work with me to make a difference. So the judge on the strength of that letter um, gave me a reduction and he cited that it was because of this retired homicide detective that believed in me and made a commitment to work with me immediately upon my release. And to stand true to that, when I received immediate release on November 29th, 2017, when I received immediate release, Gary McFadden came to my house that night at 10.30 and he hugged me and he said, it's time to work. And it was right then that he made a commitment to make sure that what we said we was going to do with this incarceration prevention class become a reality. And when I tell you that today, him and I teach a incarceration prevention class at Martin Luther King Middle School for the kids, um, and it's, it's just it's just a testament of faith. But bigger than that. The fact that he's been very instrumental in everything that I've done with my organization since I got out. And on top of that, in, in, in conjunction with the Community Empowerment Initiative, the CMPD, Gary wants to take the same thing to the Mecklenburg County Jail. And instead of these kids sitting in their solitary confinement and getting that post-traumatic uh, 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 stress syndrome, he wants to actually take these kids and give them the character education that they need. And that is why I am supporting Gary McFadden.